what we will do is we will go and collect all this data from all these different platforms, including uh, our own agency data. We look for data on SRX, we look for data on web, um, on uh, paid subscription platforms like Square Foot and vice versa. And we take all these data and we analyze them and we present it to our clients. How do you know what is the right price to offer for your house? What are some negotiation tips that you need to know? In this video, I'll be finding out the answers from my friend, JJ Ong. How do I even find out what's my budget? For buying a house so i think when it comes to your budget right if you're buying an hdb flat there are if you're buying a resale hdb flat there are certain things like can you get different types of grants right whether you can take a loan or not uh, whether you can take a hdb loan or you have to take a bank loan there are different eligibility criteria and a lot of all these things is actually based on your salary I think the first thing is to get down to doing a proper financial calculation for your affordability including how much loan you can get, what are the grants you can get and uh, what, how much money you have in your CPF, how much cash you have on hand and all these things will make up your affordability, right? And it's, it's, it's very important to calculate this as accurately as possible especially if you're buying a HDB flat because there are a lot of eligibility conditions as to whether you can or cannot buy and how much you can afford. So right now you can find out all this from the HFE letter, right? Correct. So that's why step number one, right, is really to go and apply for your HFE because HFE is number one, free to apply, not sponsored by HDB, <laughs> free to apply. Uh, and it basically tells you like almost everything that you need to know already, which is what can you buy? Because mm. some people might think that, oh, you know, like I want to go and apply for a four room BTO. I want to apply, I want to go and buy a resale four bedroom um, HDB and I can get a certain amount of grants. Then you realize, hey, I cannot because um, I make too much money <laughs> kind of thing, right? Like I, I have my, your salary too high, right? So go and apply for HFE, submit all your information and HDB will come back to you with an HFE letter to tell you what you can buy, what are the grants you are eligible for, whether you are eligible for HDB loan or you cannot take an HDB loan, uh, you have to take a bank loan and vice versa. Actually about the HFE letter, right? when is the right time to apply, to apply for it? Like, is it right before you want to buy a house or is it a much earlier than that? You know, we keep talking about purpose, right? Once your purpose is, is set, that means you know you need to buy a house, you know roughly when you need the house, then go and apply. Because now HFE is valid for, it used to be valid for six months, now it's valid for nine months. So you actually have like a plenty of time. La. I rarely meet people who search for a house for nine months one. <laughs> because the HFE letter is actually only needed until you option the house. Okay. Yeah, so you have to have the HFE letter before you pay your $1,000 option fee for HDB. Right now, what is the waiting time for HFE? Uh, according to HDB's website, it's 21 working days. But usually, right, during like very, very hot periods, like for example, February got BTO launch, SBF launch, the whole Singapore want to buy house one will apply. So HDB have limited manpower. It might take about longer like maybe two months usually right i would say about one month is the is the time okay so after the hfd letter the second thing like you can you see a house that you like how do you prepare yourself before you even start to negotiate your price firstly when you have your hfd letter then the next step right is based on your uh, amount of grants based on your eligibility of a loan in, in including how much loan you can get you have to go and add that up with your CPF OA amount combined if you are buying as a family if you are buying as a single what is your CPF OA amount how much cash you have on hand and add all this up right you will have uh, a figure so when you go shopping you will have to use that figure as a guide so let's say I add everything up right my loan my grant my CPF OA plus my um, cash I have say about $700,000, right? So when you go shopping, right? When you go and do the filtering of property guru, you try to find houses that is within the $700,000 plus minus 20, 30,000 range lah. Because if it's a bit higher, there's a possibility that you can negotiate down mm. and vice versa. And one thing, one mistake that a lot of people make here, right? Is that they add everything up and then they think they can afford. Then after that, they realize they cannot afford because they realize, eh, I need to renovate the house, uh -huh. which is actually quite pricey these days. So um, there are also other random costs like, you know, like uh, house insurance, uh, conveyancing fee for lawyers, if you're using a private banker, private lawyer, you know, um, and, and all these things. Lah. So there are like all these like hundred, hundred dollar, hundred dollar, few thousand dollars, they actually add up. Um, so I think it's very important to sit down and understand what all the costs involved because 
apart from the purchase price, right, you still need to add all these miscellaneous costs plus stamp duty. Right. Right. So your buyer stamp duty, it can uh, amount up to quite a bit if you're not careful. How do I know what's the right price to offer? Like, should we just go with the price that we see on like maybe Property Guru? Yeah, so I think in the previous video, right, we mentioned that on Property Guru, there are a few different types of listing prices that are starting from and negotiable, the two main types. Lah. So if it's negotiable, there is a chance that you might be able to negotiate down lower if the demand is not very high. If the demand is very high and there is someone else that comes in to offer higher, um, basically no chance for you already. Lah. So how we decide what is a good price, what is a fair price, lah, right? Because what is good might be different for everybody, right? But what is fair is, is factual. So how do we determine what is fair is we look at the past transactions. Right now, Webu is running an awesome exclusive cash transfer in promo, which will let you get up to $2,000 US worth of cash vouchers and $500 US worth of trading vouchers by signing up with my link and fulfilling the requirements. And the best part, both new and existing users are eligible to take part in this promo as long as you have not transferred any stocks into Webu prior to this. To take part in this promo, all you need to do is open up the app Head over to menu, look for the transfer in promo in the promotion center, then tap participate now. Head back out, then tap on the Webu logo at the bottom, transfers, shares, transfer in, then tap transfer US shares. You will need to fill in the details of the transfer in request, such as the info of the broker that you are transferring from, the broker's email address, and the stocks that you want to transfer in. Once that is done, you will need to contact the other broker to initiate the transfer request. For example, if you are using IBKR, in the website, click on transfer and pay, transfer positions outgoing. For the transfer method, select all other regions. Then select free of payment transfer of global securities. Fill in the financial institution info for transfer all assets. Select no if you want to only transfer selected stocks. Then choose the stocks that you want to transfer. The transfer may take up to 21 business days to process and you will need to transfer at least 10,000 US dollars worth of eligible US stocks or ETFs in order to receive the rewards. If the other broker charges you a fee for the transfer, Webu has a transfer out fee subsidy of up to 150 US dollars upon successful transfer in shares of 5,000 US dollars or more. Just make sure to submit proof of the transfer fee to Webu to get the transfer out fee subsidy. In order to get the rewards, you will need to maintain the positions in Webu for 90 days. If you are interested in taking part in this promo, you can sign up to Webu using my link down below. And with that being said, let's get back to the video. So for those of um, those of the buyers who have agents, right, what we will do is we will go and collect all this data from all these different platforms, including uh, our own agency data. We look for data on SRX, we look for data on um, on uh, paid subscription platforms like Square Foot and vice versa. And we take all this data and we analyze them and we present it to our clients to show them that, okay, so in this block, right, what are the past transactions? In this neighborhood, in this street, what are the past transactions? and we make a decision based on that. So how we do that is um, if the past transactions are all roughly around the 600 to, 7, to like 650 range, and if the price, if, if the flat is listing at 750, um, then it's slightly higher already. You know that and you still go and buy, it's always better than you don't know that, then you blah, blah, go and buy. Lah. But then this is, this is when you have a, an agent with you, right? Mm. You don't have an agent with you. Is there like any resource that I can use? Yeah, so usually this part is is uh, most most agents, right? Okay, so to be fair, we're out here to make a living, right? So every agent will tell you that, oh, you know, like, got agent better because we've got access to data. But the truth is, right, consumers also can access some of the data. Maybe not as detailed, maybe not so much, but if you really, really want to do some pre-research, right, you just go and Google HDB past transactions and you go to HDB's website. HDB's website, right? You can actually obtain the past transaction data also. But then you have to do the work of analyzing yourself. Correct, which is the part that is a bit late. So the fact of the matter is right, you can do yourself, right? You can go and gather all this data. If you want to go and pay for the data, right, which is what we know, you, you can even. But 
um, it takes up time, it takes up money. Uh, most people that come to us really just prefer, I mean, it's a long, hard day at work. You just subcon this to someone else, pay a couple thousand dollars and call it a day la, if you trust <laughs> the guy. Yeah, but if you if you are very passionate about it, like if you are also very passionate about purchasing your own house yourself, the data and all this information is actually available to you. Uh, you just go and search HDB past transactions and you go to HDB's website. There's a portal that allows you to see some of the information. Okay, so just now you mentioned about COE. La, mm. la, so cash over valuation. So is it actually a bad thing to like pay higher price for a property and pay that COV? I think it really depends. So so how COV works is that the every every house has a purchase price, which is uh, what you negotiate with the seller, and then it has a valuation. So how it works is after you you pay the option fee, you will, the buyer will have to go and apply for a valuation, right? And HDB's valuer will come down to valuate the house. So for example, if your purchase price is seven hundred thousand, and HDB's valuer come down and say, oh, the value of this house is six hundred fifty thousand, that means you are paying fifty thousand dollars above valuation and that is known as COV which means that you are according to HDB right paying $50,000 above the market a fair price la. there is no good or bad in this case in fact in this very uh, in this housing market right COV is actually very common so COV that range from 10k 20k 30k is basically almost a daily occurrence right because if you buy a house that is very very well renovated and what we call move-in condition you pay $55,000 or $80,000 even for a house like that, right? Then you can save on your renovation cost. For some people, it's quite worthy one because you not only save on the cost, you save on the time. Renovation takes time also. That's true. Right, yeah. So TOV might not always be a bad thing. You just need to know why you're paying it. If you don't have a reason or purpose of paying COV, right, then then it's bad because you're just wasting money, right? And and one one of the very important things to take note, right, is that some people they like, okay, I'm willing to pay higher than market because they think they can use CPF to pay, like they can use grant to pay, yeah. but they cannot because COV must be paid using cash, <laughs> like in the bank, like kind of cash so it has to be because that's why it's called cash over valuation okay. it must be in cash I guess like property agents get quite a bad name because like it feels like they're just there to take your money kind of thing yeah, uh, then, yeah. Like, wouldn't there be a conflict like let's say if I want to negotiate would my property agent even help me negotiate down the price because if I were to negotiate down mm. this means that they'll be getting lesser pay mm. Correct. Right. Like, so, so wouldn't there be a conflict of interest counting? This one really is up to you to pick a property agent or consultant that you you trust, lah. Like you said, right? I mean, we are all here to make a living, right? There are some people that are a bit more aggressive than others. I think for most most property agents, lah. I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but for most agents, we are here for the long haul. Like my example in the earlier video, right? I mentioned that I actually advise my clients to not pay so high COV, which means that I'm actually sabotaging my own deal. He already willing to pay already, but I still tell him, bro, I think a bit too high. And then he say, no, no, I want to continue. So I did my part of advising him, right? To say like, I think it's a bit high, but um, his purpose is very strong. He wants to go ahead. By logic, right? For a salesperson, it's, it's, it's like, you gonna score by your manager and because you're you're basically sabotaging your own deal um for the sake of the client and the client might say like okay then I don't want already then the deal is, is done it's gone right but for I think for most property agents who are in it for the long haul right we are here to build relationship with my clients with our clients so we do our best we make a bit less money it's, it's okay man most of us survive in this industry is through referrals like we do a super solid job in in the opinion of the clients and if he wants to sell his property next time, I wouldn't be his ex-property agent. I will be his property agent for his whole journey, right? And if he has a friend that, is, that needs somebody else, he would recommend me lah because he knows that I'm honest and I'm not here to make a quick buck. I'm here to make a living, right? And that means I need to be here for the next however hundred years or however many years that I live lah. I heard of this thing before. Basically, it's like saying uh, you are giving out more value than what you are paid. Uh, so because like if you are doing more than what is required of you, you would mm. like what you say is you are in here for the long haul. So it's pointless to make the extra few hundred dollars, but your your future relationships are all sabotaged. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Which is why I think a lot of businesses and salespeople out there, not just in real estate, they like to attract clients by giving discounts, right? So when you give like very very big discounts, right? Um the service that you that you provide might not be 
as quality also because now you're serving yeah you're, you're serving a bit too many people that you can handle then the quality of service might not be so good lah so i think it really depends on it's like you know what people say like even send even for right there, there's a market rate like for me personally um i i don't negotiate on my rates because i know that i will give if you pay me my one percent or my two percent i will give you my 200 percent um I, I think you deserve that yeah i'm very cliche all right <laughs> it, it is it is very it is very cliche but um that one is really up to you okay okay i think commission aside right the most important thing is you must trust your guy or girl that you hire because they are going to be the ones that is your mouthpiece they are going to be representing you so you have to be sure that you can trust them to help you make the best decision when buy a house do you even need an agent to represent you or can you just go and do your house serving and save all that on two percent healthy maybe i'll give an analogy here lah. so you can make coffee at home yourself you can go to the market you can buy the sugar buy the coffee bean grind yourself and you know buy the machine and everything but why do cafes that specialize in coffee even starbucks right a chain still doing still do so well because there is a value in paying for something so if you can see the value then, then you pay for the service, right? If you cannot see the value, then you will have to be okay with investing in doing it yourself because doing it yourself is not free as, as what most people think, right? So back to the coffee analogy, if you want to make coffee yourself at home, you want to make good coffee yourself at home, you have to buy the coffee machine, you buy the grinder, buy the select the correct beans, understand the process of roasting, the, the, the kind of thing. It takes time, if not money, it takes time and effort. The answer to can you do it yourself is can that definitely can but are you willing to make those sacrifices to do it yourself if the answer is yes right 100 you should do it yourself because like hey if you like it and if you enjoy the process of doing it yourself right then why why pay someone else to do it yeah, yeah. yeah but if you um if you see the value in engaging someone that you can trust to do it then um you definitely should lah, because that saves you time that saves you money and it allows you to transition into the next phase of your life with a little bit more of a peace of mind okay so let's say if you need an agent like how do you even find a good agent that you can trust i think the most important thing is that there are many good agents out there but what is good for you might not be good for someone else so i think the most important thing right is to find someone that you can vibe with right you can find someone that that clicks with you that understands you understands your what you want and and vice versa i would say step number one is go and look around your circle friends family that you can trust lah not that um, you know, like uncle that you see once every few years at a wedding or something, like someone that you can trust in your circle that is in the industry that has uh, enough experience to help you. Like, I think that's step number one. Mm-hmm. Step number two, right, is when you do get approached by agents or when you do engage an agent that is a complete stranger, step number one is go and check to make sure they are registered. Because unfortunately, there are a lot of people out there right now impersonating property agents and um, scamming people. So step number one is really to go and check. How you check, right, is you can just go to the CEA public register, type in their CEA registration number, and their license should appear. If it doesn't appear, then that's red flag number one. Maybe we talk talk a little bit about if you do not really know anybody around you that is doing this or um there are people right and i i do have clients that have close friends who are real estate agents but they come to me instead not because they trust me more but because sometimes they are more private people they don't want their close friends to know their salary their cpf and and these things lah so so they come to a stranger so if you do go to a stranger i think it's very important to um, build some kind of rapport with the stranger like me for example if you don't know me and you come to me I think what most good agents will do right is they will provide a free session to do like a consultation think of it as speed dating apart from helping you to get your numbers right apart from helping you to understand the timeline which is basically completely free uh, it also serves as a way for us to see if I can help you or not can I work with you as, as a client and do you like me in the first place because maybe I am super good at my job but you don't like me right then the, the working relationship is not gonna work out also because whatever I tell you right you're gonna suspect me whatever I do for you right you're gonna think that oh maybe not so good and then uh, then, it, then it might not be as efficient. Uh. It's better not to work together there. Correct, right? It, it, it works both ways. Like maybe I don't vibe with my client. Then I might always be suspecting, is he telling me the truth? Is he, does he get more money in his CPF? Then, you know, it's not an efficient working relationship. Not every 
working relationship is perfect just because right the person is very good at his or her job yeah so i think the most important thing is just make sure that the person is not a scammer and find someone that you can vibe with that is experienced enough to do a good job i think with that being said uh that's all for this video uh, any last words last words <laughs> uh yeah if you if you're looking for a house don't call me like the first thing to do is go and call someone that you that is already in your circle that you trust. If not, then you can call Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me. Uh, I will, I'll just leave his uh, links down below if you need. Uh, whether you are buying or not buying, if you have any questions, do ask me. <laughs> <laughs> you will be way more qualified than me. Right, then that's all. Thank you for uh, answering these questions. Thank you, Calvin. Right, thanks. Bye.